we've been in a series entitled The Rest of Your Life. And it's all about finding rest for our day-to-day daily lives. Now, believe it or not, according to the scriptures, what we've been learning is that you and I were never created to live life at the pace of a hamster. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You ever seen a hamster get on a wheel? Man, they run, they run, they run, they run, they run, they run. But have you ever noticed they get nowhere? The thing about it is this. They don't know it. They just keep running. And unfortunately for some of us, that's the way we live life. We, lo- we live at such a fast pace and we're striving, we're struggling, we're, we're pressing, we're, we're, we're trying to get somewhere while getting nowhere really, really fast. See, God's original design for our lives, as we'll see, has always been to live in a state of rest. Now, I know dad, dads, for some of you, you want to leverage that Father's Day privilege and go, see, I'm sitting on the couch today. But that's not what we're talking about here. Yes, enjoy the couch too. What we're talking about is that you can face life and still find a place of peace and rest. You really can thrive while trying to survive. That makes sense? And so unfortunately, too many people spend their lives looking forward to the rest of their lives. Let me tell you what I mean by that. It's in the form and shape of self-effort where we're striving to survive. We're grinding ourselves into the ground in hopes that one day we have just a few years above the ground. Retirement, right? We're, we're, We're trying to get somewhere. But here's the question. Does it produce rest? Are you at peace? Or is your mind constantly going 100 miles a minute? See, dads are driven to ride, to, to, to drive. That's what we do. We get in the driver's seat. We want to go, 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 go. But dads, let me speak to your heart for a moment. Because I understand your heart to do. I understand your heart to fight for your family. I understand your heart to provide. I understand your heart to, to discipline, to teach. Let me also speak to your heart today that God wants you to discover this place of rest where you can follow him while leading your family and not worry because he's faithful. I pray you're hearing that, dads. I pray you're hearing that because I, I can relate to you, man. I've been that dad where it's just like, they're the, I'm the hammer and they're the nail. And I thought I was doing something good, right? And so let's turn to a foundational portion of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 1. We've been in this the last couple of weeks. It starts off on verse 1 by saying, Now the promise of entering into God's rest is still for us today. Go ahead and look at somebody. If you're online, share with somebody. It's still available today. today. Now, Now, I want you to think about that because this is not my opinion here. This is God's word. He says, so we must be extremely careful to ensure that we all embrace the fullness of that promise and not fail to experience it. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did. This is speaking of the people of Israel who were a people of promise but never entered into it. But watch why. Yet they didn't join their faith with the word. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply, for they doubted. For those of us who believe, watch this, faith activates the promise and we experience the realm of confident rest. Somebody go, don't you just find yourself wanting to be there? If you're still looking for that place, I want you to consider what you've been missing from God's Word. I want you to consider that. See, if we stop to consider the Word of God here, it proves to be quite challenging. I'll tell you why. It challenges the very fabric, the fiber, the, the construct of our lives, and what we've been conditioned to. Why? Because we live in a world that has normalized busyness. It's normal to struggle, to strive. It's normal to grind it out in life, even in the church world. Listen, we've made relationship with God about grinding to behave, to somehow be pleasing before God. We've made it about rules and performance and appearances. And the the reality is that the results that we've been getting, whether you're a believer or not, but you're grinding in life, the results we've been getting is anxiousness. Stress, it's and a propensity to take on more burdens and live with unrest. 
and call it normal. But you see, this way of life, it comes in direct conflict with what we just saw from God's word. It comes in direct conflict to the rat race that we run in life. It comes in direct conflict to what we believe life is all about. It's the very reason why God says in his word, there is still a rest that is available to us today. You know what that implies? It implies that there are people that are not entering into that rest. It implies that maybe, just maybe, and hey, if the shoe fits, don't wear it, change it. But maybe, just maybe, it's speaking directly to you and saying, it's the reason why you're not at rest. Because you're doing this your way. You're following another norm, which isn't normal for you at all. Can I encourage you believers? Be weird. Be weird. Don't fall into the mold of this world, right? Now, here's the thing. It's for this reason that Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, starting at verse 28, he says, come to me. Listen, 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 listen to the heart of God. Listen to the heartbeat of God the Father. Not just on Father's Day, but every day. God, listen to his heart. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Rest. But not the kind of rest that you're used to, like a day off. Like when you just detach from your problems for a moment, but then you pick them back up. Not that kind of rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, rest is not a byproduct of the days off that we take. Rest is not a byproduct of the vacations that we go on. Rest is not a byproduct of the things that we detach from. Why? Because we pick those things back up. Rest occurs in the soul. Let me ask you a question. Are you truly in a place of rest? It's a good question to consider. And so what we have here, according to the words of Jesus, is an open invitation to enter into a life of rest that has the power to continually work deep within our souls and transcend and impact the remainder of our lives. Every area of our lives. I don't know about you, but I want that. I want that every day. I want to be right there. And so we have to ask ourselves, why is it that we don't enter into that rest? Why? Why is it so hard to live this way? I mean, what, what's stopping us? And I'm so glad you asked that question because I believe God gave me an answer to that. To me first, by the way, because I need to practice this and stay in this place. The answers to these life-defining questions are unlocked through the words of Jesus when he says this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know, these words are powerful because they challenge the very core of our values. This invitation herein is one that kind of beckons us to unhitch to unhook, to cut off from those things in life which we believe better us and are better for us so that we can go a better way with Christ. And so I want you to consider the magnitude of his words because when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he's alluding to a practice in those days and in some places it's still common today where you would yoke to animals. And the way you would go about doing this so that you can accomplish uh, the work and, and, and raise up a herd of animals that accomplish what you wanted them to do was you would always pair an older animal with a younger animal. Why? Because the older animal is broken in. The older animal is learned. The older animal understands what it takes to get the job done and still enjoy the process as it treads the ground and eats at the same time. And so the Let's use ox for instance, oxen, for example. You would take an older ox who was slow and steady in his pace, and you would pair him with a younger ox. And the younger ox believes, I can do it all. I can accomplish it all. I can get there faster. I can go farther because I'm stronger. I'm younger. And so it pushes, and it prods, and it pulls, and it grunts, and it pushes, and it prods, and it, and, and it pushes, and it pulls, and it grunts. And meanwhile, while it's fighting to get there, the older ox is walking steady at its pace. 
eventually this younger animal realizes something. Man, I'm exhausted. Why? And they realize this guy has the right pace for life. See, it's an invitation to come in direct relationship with Christ and to hitch ourselves to live lives connected to him that prove to provide us greater value than that which we spend our time, our energies, our emotions, and our day-to-day efforts in pursuit of what we believe adds value to us. So let me ask you a question. You're talking about value. Have you ever thought about why you work the majority of your day and your lifespan? Have you thought about that? Why, Why do you do that? Have you ever thought about why you invest so much into people, into relationships, and sometimes, many times, into relationships that don't even reap us a benefit, don't give a, a proper return? Have you ever thought about why you push so hard to succeed, to achieve, and even to maintain a lifestyle? Have you ever thought about that? I'll tell you why. It's because of the value that we believe it adds to our lives. It's the reason for the rat race. We see some sort of value in those things. Now, today I'd like to invite you into a conversation with God through his word. I have nothing to do with this conversation. I may, de- I may deliver some principles from the word. I may point you to some things, but I just want you to consider the weight of the truth in God's word for your life and mine today. Can we do that? Is that all right? So today I want to talk to you on the topic, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Go ahead and ask yourself that question. Say that with me. Is it worth it? Is what worth it? Ha. Let me ask you this. If how you're living your life, is how you're living your life worth the stress? Is what you're so busy with worth the struggle? Is is it worth the pain? Is it worth the weight that you carry? Is it worth the doubts that you live with? Is it worth the time that it takes? Is it worth it? Now, I get it. There are things in life that we have to do. But is it worth the way you're going about it and the way you're processing as a result of them? Is it worth that stress? Is it time for a change? See, the reason why we pursue life in this cyclical downward spiral that we don't know how to break out of is because we're pursuing worth that we're not achieving, like the ox. So we're trying to add worth to the lives that God has given us. But here's what we're missing. We're not realizing that God has already deemed our lives worthy. See, you possess value. God paid the ultimate price through Jesus Christ because you are worth it on your worst day. That's a good God. See, you are blessed. You do have power. You are. You do have purposes for your life. And there is a place called rest for you. You know, sometimes as Christians, we get so much into our little Christian box that we forget that what Jesus did was for the entire world. So whether you believe in Christ or not, just know this. God believes in you enough that he saw it fit to pay the price. And so the scriptures introduce us to a guy named Solomon. And this guy Solomon was a man who who climbed to the highest pinnacles of life, man. This, This guy had it all. He had kingdoms. He had acclaim. He had power. He had riches. He had possessions. You name it, he had it. He had all the toys. He had all the friends. He had all the people. He had all the honor, all that. But listen to his conclusion at the latter end of his life in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting at verse 2. He says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Listen to what he says. What do people gain from all their labors which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place of streams 
to the place the streams come from, they, there they return again. All things are wearisome more than one can say. Listen to this. The eye never has enough seeing, and nor the ear its fill of hearing. His conclusion after achieving all that many of us would hope to aspire to is this. It's meaningless. Meaningless. That word meaningless there is interesting because it means empty in the Hebrew. It speaks of something that is unsatisfactory. The Hebrew language in the old times especially is very interesting because it looks like letters that we would assume it's letters, but it's actually drawings that depict something. And in the Hebrew, the understanding to this word when they saw it and when they see it, uh, scholars, what they understand is that it depicts a vapor of breath. Let me, de- let me, let me show you that. And here's, here's what Solomon says. This is what many people are really chasing after. Where is it? You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't grasp it. You can't hold on to it. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is this, that life, what we think life is, has very little value in comparison to what God is trying to reveal to us. It's empty. It's empty. So many people are really chasing an illusion. The illusion that life's value consists in what we do, what we achieve, and what we possess. Solomon says, there's no gain from the toil that we endeavor upon in this life. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. So let's explore what this guy, Solomon, derived his gain from. What did he know in his beginnings that we, didn't, that we don't? The scriptures introduce us to Solomon's reign as king over Israel at a time when Solomon had it all before him. But he realized he had nothing at all. You see, when he became king, Solomon inherited a kingdom that was strong, it was intact, it was established by his father, King David. His enemies were at bay. His wealth was intact. Why? Because his, fa- his father had done an a, a elaborate building campaign which provided much resources for the building of the temple that Solomon would undertake. And so there was much provided there. The precepts of God and the love for him were at the foundation of daily life in most of Israel. And for all intents and purposes, it appeared that Solomon was set. That all he had to do was just step in and assume his father's role and his throne as king. And while Solomon had inherited a great kingdom that immediately increased his standing, Solomon perceived that he was lacking the most important, the most valuable thing that life was about. The Bible says that one day early on in his reign, that God appeared to him in a dream and said to him, Ask of me whatever you want. Get this. This is God Almighty giving him a blank check. Whatever you want. So let me ask you something. I know you'd like to be in Solomon's shoes right now, right? So let's act like we're there for a moment. I want you to, I want you to ask yourself this question. What would you ask for? What would you ask for? If we're honest, you and I would probably ask along the lines of our greatest need. It it could be something like healing in your body. It could be money for your physical needs and wants. It could be an upgrade on your standing in life. It could be promotion in a career. It could be restoration in a relationship. It could be peace in your home. It could be blessing upon your efforts. And there's nothing wrong with those requests except that we have to consider the heart behind them. We have to consider what's really driving those requests. Think about it. God is giving you a blank check, and your request is my money, my relationships, my home. See, what that reveals is this. It reveals that your request before God is not about God. It's about 
this person that we all are intimately familiar with. May I introduce you to a person called me? It's me. And no, don't point fingers at me because we're not talking about me. Let's be honest here, right? And so Solomon saw value beyond himself in this moment. Listen to his request in response to God's blank check. In 1 Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 7, he says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant, watch his posture before God. You've made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child. You know what he's saying there in the original language? He's saying I'm inexperienced. I don't know that I can do this. He says, I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen. A great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Solomon desired God's wisdom to do what God had chosen him for and to do what was right before God. You know, I think life would be a lot simpler if that was our approach. I really do. You know, when you get me out the way, you also get a mess out the way. Because we have a tendency to create messes. Isn't that true? And so he understood that possessing God's wisdom and possessing relationship with God was more valuable than anything else in life. And as a result of the great value that he ascribed to God and his ways in his life, God's response to his request was amazing. Listen to 1 Kings chapter 3, starting at verse 10. It says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. And so God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, for who? Yourself. Did you hear that? Nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice. In other words, for doing what's right. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be moreover. In other words, in addition, in, in other words, let me add to the account. Let me add value. He says, moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Now, wait a minute. This is God and his response to this man's request was this. I will add value to your life. Because you see the value in what I bring into your life. Can we just take a pause real quick? A Selah moment, according to what the psalm says. It's a musical notation that indicated to the reader and to the singer that this was a moment where you paused, where there was silence. Let's Selah for a moment and consider this. Have you stopped to think of the immense value that God brings to your life? Man, that's powerful. I get chills just thinking about that because you know what? I, I don't have a tendency to think that way on my day to day. But it's valuable to us to stop there. And so what can we learn about what's most valuable in life? What can we learn about assessing what's really worth it in life? Now, I want to just leave you with a couple of points today in the next couple of moments that I have. The first one that I want to leave you with is this. It's that we experience the most value out of life when we value God the most. Let me say that again. We experience the most value out of life when we value God the most. Solomon was a man, as we saw already, who was set from the onset. Man, this guy was of royal lineage. He grew up with the finest things in life. He was surrounded by people of nobility. He grew under the example of a father that, while flawed, always overcame these flaws and remained in power because he followed God, because he had a heart after God. But when it counted most, Solomon did not turn back in reflection to his prior experiences. 
He did not turn to any of the people in his royal court or to his friends. He did not even turn to his title or depend on his power as king. No, instead, Solomon turned to the one and most valuable thing in his life, Selah. He turned to God. He depended upon God. He looked to God with extreme confidence. Wow. Wow. Here's a question to consider. Who do you turn to? Who do you turn to? Don't answer that for me. Be be honest in your own heart. Who do you turn to? See, who or what we turn to defines what we value most. That is such a true statement. Who or what we turn to defines what we value most. Think about who you're turning to, and that'll tell you who you value, what you value most. If you find yourself depending upon things or people or whatever, you are dealing with faulty scales. You've got a wrong reading on what life is about. You're getting the wrong measurements, the wrong weights. And what you don't realize is that what you deem valuable isn't of much value at all. You know, there were several times when the people of Israel grew to depend upon themselves, really. Themselves and on things, people, in an attempt to find the value that God had placed upon their lives. But this is when it went bad for them. And I want us to see why. Let's look at a portion of Scripture that gives us some understanding of that. Jeremiah 10, starting at verse 3, says, For the practices of the people are, watch this, worthless. They cut a tree out of a forest. And a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols do not speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do, listen to this, any good. Any good. See, like the people of Israel, anything that we do in search of value apart from God is worthless. I'll prove it to you. That check that you strive for, that retirement that you're you're pressing towards, those things that you cling to that you feel make you happy, how come you still are chasing them? I'm going to tell you why. Because they never fulfill They might fill you for a moment, but they don't fulfill you for a lifetime. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Come on, I know I'm speaking to somebody who at one time said, if I could just get to this place in life, I'll be all right. Well, here you are, and what's your conclusion? Meaningless. Right? See, life's value is not in the length of our days, nor is it in the things that we think we possess, which actually possess us, or the goals that we strive to achieve. You know why? Because that's idol worship. And guess who we're idolizing? Remember that person I introduced you to earlier? Me. So Solomon goes on to say after recapping all his pursuits and achievements in life, Ecclesiastes is a book that's written at the tail end of Solomon's life. It's really a book of laments. He's regretting the choices he made. Listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes 13, 13. Now all has been heard. In other words, I've seen it all. I've done it all. I've tried it all. I've reached the highest pinnacles of life as we desire it. And he says this. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty, this is the occupation, is what he's saying, of all mankind. You want the best job you can ever, you want a career that's rock solid? Trust God and follow him. That's the greatest occupation that we could ever aspire to in life. So make it your aim to seek God and you'll find true value for life. Which leads me to my next point. We get the most value out of life when we value what God values the most. Let me say that again. We get the most value out of life 
when we value what God values the most. Listen, you don't need projections for this, like people that run the stock market. You don't need all these samples and, 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 and all these things that kind of indicate where it might go. Listen, when you value what's most valuable to God, it will always reap greater value in your life. So by default, as king over Israel, as we heard, Solomon was enriched with great possessions, with power. This guy was honored, man. I mean, kings, queens. Royalty would travel from all corners of the earth to bow down just to hear the wisdom that would flow from him. But according to the scriptures, we find that none of it was valuable. Notice what God says to him at the beginning when we meet Solomon at a tender place in his heart where God was most valuable to him. God says to him, because you asked for my wisdom and helped to do what is right before me, I'm paraphrasing here, he says, I will give you what you did not ask for, wealth and honor. Selah, pause for a moment. But Solomon was already wealthy. Or was he? Was he? See, what we see here is that while he was enriched materially before and before the eyes of all, Solomon was not enriched at all. Let me, let me tell you what I'm, what I'm talking about here. Proverbs 10.22 puts it this way. These are the words of Solomon, penned by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Without painful toil for it. The reason why Solomon lacked true riches up until this point when he first met God was because he was trying to figure out how he could do what God called him to do on his own. We know that to be true because his request reveals that he was overwhelmed with the concern as to how he was to lead the people. See, when the value you seek in life is based on what God values most, you begin to discover true wealth. And I just heard somebody think this. Well, what's true wealth? I'm so glad you asked that question. You know what true wealth is? True wealth is increase without toil or sweat. You could go back to the beginning of creation and you'll find that. No toil, no sweat. The land produced for them. Everything they touched prospered. They were in perfect relationship with God and each other. And then guess what? We mucked that up. We messed it up. Oh, we made it grimy and slimy and whatever else rhymes with that. True wealth is increased without toil. It's the state of loving God above all and experiencing his blessing over all you do. Now, I know that many of you, you're regulars here, and for those of you online uh, as well, but for some of you, you know, maybe you haven't heard this. I just want to share this because this is just my testimony in the midst of the testing when we first started. We were youth pastors in a very large, successful church for over seven years, and we felt God calling us to launch something, to start something here in this, in this city. And, and so we literally took a step of faith. And when I tell you a step of faith, it's like there was nothing there, but we trusted God. So we took this step of faith, and listen, we didn't have a launch team. We didn't have, you know, a check a nice big check to help us start things. We, we had none of that. But we had God. And I remember my, my concern the next day after we were officially done. I said, Lord, how's this going to work? I have a family. I have kids. They're in college. I have a dog. I have cars. I have a mortgage, insurance. I got to eat. You know, it's focusing on me. And I don't have time to get into the whole story, but God basically took me to Genesis 15, 1, where he says to Abraham, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm your exceedingly great reward. I said, okay, God, I'm trusting you completely, but how's this going to work? So later on that same day, a buddy of mine calls me who, who's a, who was a principal, and I didn't know this at the time. He had just become a principal. He was a principal at a high school that, he's still the principal there, at a high school in Ellenville, which is in Sullivan County. And, uh, 
And so he, uh, he contacted me. He was like, man, Jose, how are you doing? And I knew him from my days as a youth pastor. And he would allow me to come into Middletown High School where he was an assistant principal and work with kids, all kinds of cool stuff. So he says, man, how are you doing? I've been thinking about something. I'm like, man, Carl's great. He goes, how's the church? And he's talking about the church where I was working at. And I said, um, yeah, I, it's great over there, but we've moved on. We're, we're starting a church. He goes, man, that's awesome. He goes, wait, you're starting a church? And I said, yeah. He goes, so you got a good amount of people? I said, Carl, I don't even know where they're going to come from. <laughs> no clue. No clue. He says, so out of, out of a genuine concern, he says to me, so how how you guys, I mean, you, you, you got a job? You looking for a job? You know, what are you going to do? And out of my mouth, out of my mouth came out something that two things happened in my brain. One in my brain, one in my heart. I said to him, I'm starting a consulting company. And in my brain, I said to myself, what consulting company? (laughs) And in my heart, I was having this conversation with God where I realized what God was telling me. Jose, use what I've placed in your hands. Use the experience. Use the word. Use the anointing. Use everything that you've done, your experience in management and in nonprofit sectors and all that. Use all that. And so I said, I'm going to start a consulting company. He goes, what kind of consulting company? I said, I'm going to start working with kids in schools. I'm going to do assemblies. I'm going to go to after-school programs. I'm going to work in different places. And I'm going to challenge kids to think about uh, cognitive skills. I'm going to help them think about how they process and how they get to the point where they're making errors and they don't even realize the thinking and the rationale that's working. I'm going to teach them some skills. And he goes, man, this is great. He says, why don't you come see me on Friday? And so I get there on Friday not knowing what to expect. And as I walk into the room, there's a, his whole social work team is there. His assistant principal and some of his lead teachers are there and some people from the district. And I pull in and I'm like, okay. He goes, hey, I want to introduce you guys to my friend Jose Vasquez. He was a pastor at a church in Middletown. He's now pastoring a new church out in Newburgh. But he's got a consulting company. He's doing some great work. Jose, why don't you tell us about what you're doing? You got you to hear this. Out of my mouth, I say for the last seven years, I've been teaching people, working with families. And guess what came out of my mouth? Seven years worth in a matter of minutes of messages, of activities, of events, of things that God had done through little old us. His team was like, man, man, this is amazing. Love it. When can you start? I said, that's a Carl question. Carl says, Jose, I'll see you next Wednesday. I want you to do three assemblies for us. I said, great. I made $700 in a matter of three hours. That next week, Middletown High School called me. We started conversations. That same week... Uh, Newburgh, uh, the Boys and Girls Club in Newburgh opened the door, which opened up great opportunities in the city and to really get to know people. Uh, Sullivan County BOCES opened up to us. Lincoln uh, Correctional Facility, which is for kids, opened up to us. Goshen Middle School opened up to us. And, and let me tell you something. For the next two and a half years, my wife did not have to sweat one day to try and figure out how we're going to make it. I did not sweat one day. You know why? Because I had seven years' worth of content to begin with. It was all with ease. My friends, let me tell you, place God's way at the forefront of your values, and you'll experience the value of his blessing over every area of your life. The last point I want to leave you with here as we come to a close, is this. It's that life's value is maximized by how you spend it. Let me say that again. Life's value is maximized by how you spend it. Let me give you a question to consider. What are you doing with the value of your life? You know, Solomon's reign as king began with the right value system. He valued God, and it was important to him to use that value to lead God's people to impact lives. His focus was not on enriching himself in the beginning. He didn't make decisions based on money. 
he saw the heart of God. Listen, he began by adding value to the lives of people, and as a result, it prospered him personally, and it prospered the nation of Israel. But unfortunately, the Bible records the tragic end of how Solomon spent the remainder of his life. He began with a life devoted to valuing others, but it ended in decline as he went on to seek value for himself. He was interested in that place, that person that we all know called me. The scriptures provide us great evidence and details that indicate that Solomon began to pursue increase for himself by way of knowledge of all matters. He sought to increase himself with the vast number of relationships, specifically with women. He sought to increase himself with powers he grew armies by sheer force a guy who once loved the people and trusted God now began to muscle his way around he began to subject other kings and take their armies to increase his power and he undertook massive building projects that enslaved men not just of the nations that he conquered but of his very own people he brought financial hardship to the people through by way of steep taxes that he imposed. And while he amassed much in life, and that he did, he gained little. He gained very little, and he lost hold of the value that God has entrust, had entrusted into his hands. He spent all that value that God had added unto him unwisely. I'll ask you this question again. How are you spending your life? How are you spending it? As we come to a close here, I want you to listen to what God says to us to do with what most people consider valuable in this world. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 17. It says this, as for the rich in this present age. Hold up. Say la. This is a good time to say la, Jose. My ba- the way my bank account is set up, yeah, I don't, that doesn't apply to me. I'm not rich. Stop. On the most practical level, do you know that the, a person in this country, just on public assistance, makes more than two-thirds of the world today? See, Poverty is not a matter of money. Poverty is a matter of misdirection of belief. See, everyone is prosperous based upon what you do with what God has entrusted to you. We can all prosper. And so this applies to us. So listen to this. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes, watch this, on the uncertainty of riches. Why? Because poor people focus on money. Poverty is focused on money. He says, no, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Watch this there to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold. Watch this. Of that which is truly life. See, there's a fake life, an illusion, and then there's a real one. Now I realize that this comes smack in the face of what we think me is all about life. I want you to notice that the scriptures tell us what we're supposed to do with all that we amass in life for me. He says, do good. He says, be rich in good works. He says, be generous and ready to share. See, as we take the value that God has entrusted us and increase in the blessing that he has apportioned to us and spend it wisely, watch what happens. 
will, will enjoy the value of a rich relationship with God and take hold of its benefits, what's truly valuable in life. What he adds to us. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at Church of the Bridge today. I pray that you had a personal encounter with God, that he spoke to you powerfully, and that he met you at your place of need with this message. I also want to encourage you to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. By doing so, you'll be able to check out past messages, uh, past events that we've done. You'll also be able to see what's happening now and those things that are to come. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to join with us in all that God is doing with your giving. Feel free to do so on our website. Again, thank you again for joining us, and I can't wait to connect with you next week.